message this morning and uh, I didn't know how to uh, call it so that's finally the last uh, thing <laughs> I've been thinking of pay attention and take it to heart because I, I draw the title from the scriptures that is here uh, those who are wise will pay attention so that they may understand the loving kindness of the Lord so we pay attention we take it to heart, we observe, we look at what God is doing, and we learn something and we become wiser by, by doing that. So that's why I call it like this. So this morning, if you allow me, I will, ask, I will start by asking difficult questions at first, and then we will look at some theological concept a little bit further down. How can we find peace and safety and assurance of our future in the midst of these global crises that surrounds us. And we I'll show you this picture here just to, to, to bring to your mind uh, some of the global crises. We have the tension in the Middle East with Mr. Trump's uh, peace plan that is rejected by the Palestinians the Iranians and all of these things that is happening there. We have a race to military dominations. The nuclear rearming with more modern missiles is taking place. Civil unrest, and I, I don't know how, how many, every time you turn on the headlines, you will see civil unrest somewhere. Military conflicts. The plague crickets in the uh, east of Africa, uh, that's a plague. The fires of California and Australia, the epidemics of uh, SARS, Ebola, swine influenza, H9 avian flu, novel coronavirus, the earthquakes, recents and past, the tsunamis, the climate change. And we live in the midst of all of this. It's amazing. We're still alive. <laughs> We're still here. And uh, where is God? He's still on his throne and we are still part of his kingdom. Amen? So how do we interpret these events or these crises? What are they producing in our hearts and in our conversations as well? When you're at home, you're having dinner, you're talking about, you're watching the news, you're with friends, you're with your colleagues at the office. Uh, how these events are influencing our conversation? Should we see these disasters these military conflicts, these epidemics as judgments of God? Should we see them as the fulfilling of biblical prophecies? Should we look at that as signs of the end times? These are difficult questions. I told you I was going to ask you these questions. Uh, so how do we see all of these things? But I'm not going to answer these questions for very simple reasons, because I don't know. And you also don't know. But maybe you think you know, but I think we don't know really, because the, the ways of the Lord are so much higher than ours. We see uh, partially, we understand partially, God sees the big picture to eternity. We don't know the mind of the Lord. If you remember, we went through similar questioning in 2004 after the great tsunami. Uh, what do these disasters, these events mean to us? Many even preachers and uh, prophets of dooms at that time were uh, declaring, and many of them declaring, that it, these were judgment of God against the Buddhists in Sri Lanka, against the Muslim in Indonesia. Strong condemnations uh, came and other voices came against to uh, say, we cannot say that, and, and th that's, that's not fitting with uh, our understanding of uh, the nature of God. So there's, there's conflicts, people have opinions. Uh, you hear comments, uh, you're part of conversations. I also have uh, to face that. A example of that, was 9-11 a judgment of God against America? You have heard that, or you may have uh, wondered about this. In the 1980s and 1990s, uh, was AIDS a judgment of God against homosexuality? Was it? 
uh, in a way you can look at the, this. Some people will say yes, and some people will say no, because many lesbians and homosexuals were not struck by that. And some others uh, that were nothing to do with homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, were struck with that. Uh, so how can you come to this conclusion? In 2005 was Hurricane Katrina, a judgment of God, against New Orleans and its decadence and its immorality. But many elsewhere outside of Katrina, there was the same judgment. Many Christians, many uh, businesses, churches were destroyed also when Katrina hit the, the Gulf Coast. So. And remember the 2004, the tsunami? It, was it a judgment of God? Uh, some of you will know that uh, in our church here we use uh, uh, Foundation 1 and Foundation 2 classes. And the writer of these classes, Keith Parks, has served for 14 years as a missionary in Indonesia. And this is what he had to say in 2004. It is risky for Christians to try to interpret the natural calamities as God's instruments for accomplishing his plan. It's a very risky uh, approach uh, to, to, to take this. My personal view is that God's way of working is so far above us and his thoughts are so far beyond our thoughts that we are on very uncertain biblical ground when we try to define God's purpose in natural disasters. So let's not uh, rush in and certain opinions when it comes to us. A question, what does the Bible say about pandemic diseases and sicknesses? Various outbreaks and pandemic diseases such as Ebola or coronavirus have prompted many people uh, to ask a tough question. Does God allow or even cause pandemic disease or should we see such illnesses as a sign of the end times? So let's look at some of what the Bible has to say uh, on, on that subject. The Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, describes numerous occasions when God brought plagues and diseases on his people and on his enemies. And uh, we can see some example of that in Exodus uh, in Egypt. Uh, to show his power. And we can see it in uh, this verse here. I'm going to send at this time all my plagues so that people will know that there is none like me in all the earth. Uh, if you look at these uh, scriptures in Numbers 14, Numbers 16, and 25, you will see also mention of some of these examples. And there are many others in the Old Testament. I'm just like uh, uh, looking at a few of that. God used the plagues of Egypt to force Pharaoh to free the Israelites from bondage, while at the same time he spared his people from being affected at all by these same plagues. In uh, Exodus 12, 13, and 15, 26, God is very specific in saying that I am your healer and you will not be struck by these. You will be protected when the angel of death will go over. You will not be affected by these things. We can reason that God has sovereign control over diseases and other afflictions. This is something that we can be certain of. God also warned his people of the consequences of disobedience, including plagues in Leviticus chapter 26. On two occasions that you see here mentioned, uh, God destroyed 14,700 people in one of the plagues and 24,000 for various acts of disobedience. After God gave the law to Moses, God commanded the people to obey or to suffer many evils, including something that sounds like the symptoms of what Ebola was. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, which will, which will plague you until you perish. This is in Deuteronomy 28. These are just a few examples of many plagues and disease mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, it is hard for us Christians to Imagine our loving and merciful God causing these sorts of things. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, which is 
probably prayed a lot during this time uh, at the moment. We, we, we are praying, we see it in videos, we see it in Facebook uh, plagues. When God, this is God speaking, when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain, I command locust to devour the land, send a plague among my people, if my people uh, who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You see, when you look at this prayer in view of events, then it, it changed a little bit our approach. Here we see God talking about the possibility of using disasters to draw his people it's, it's an act of, actually, if you look at the big picture, it's an act of redemption. It's, it's an act of, of uh, uh, forgiveness. It's an act where God says, I will forgive. I will heal. And, and we will talk a little bit later. Stay with me. I know I may be making it a bit uh, heavy uh, this morning, but it's good that we as Christians uh, establish our faith on, on facts and on the scriptures. God wants to lead people to repentance because there is sin, because there will be more horrible judgment if people do not live according to the standards of holiness, you know, and the law of God. Uh, I, 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 was, I, I studied a lot this subject lately, and um, there's the, the, what they call the, the mitzvah, which are the commandments of God, which are the, the standards of God, the mitzvah. Then you have the, the, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it properly, the choka, the statutes. It's more like the, when God gives some numbers and uh, some uh, very specific instructions, uh, more like the interpretation of maybe some of the, uh, uh, for example, if you steal something, you have to repay uh, four times more. So these are, it becomes like a, a very practical application. These are the, the choka uh, st statutes, uh, very precise, uh, that is application from the general commandments of God. And then you have the, the mitzvah, the judgment, and we will talk about that in, in a moment. But all of these things are to bring us to re reflect and realize the, the righteousness, the justice, the holiness, the perfections of living according to God's uh, desire. God did not give the law as a way of punishment. He gave it, uh, you know, okay, think, okay, just, just about the coronavirus uh, and the SARS, for example. We know now that it came from maybe some animals, uh, but in the law of Moses, there was a warning, don't eat certain things, they are impure, and certain things are, are pure. So there is, there is a, a wisdom, there is a, a, a ultimate uh, knowledge mm -hmm. of God behind the law that sustained a way of life for the well-being of the old earth from generation to generation. Like don't commit uh, sexual immorality, don't, don't, uh, don't get married with uh, your, your sister or your brother, you know, these kind of things are part of the law. But they are in the law for a reason, uh, you know, the mix of blood, you know, this kind of thing. So there's a lot of details about the law that is for the well-being of the planet and all of these things. And we know how this planet suffer from the consequen of consequences of sin and that uh, we will talk in a moment about the fact that we have started to die out of sin and Jesus Christ came to give us back, bring us back to have eternal life. So we have a bigger pictures and bigger uh, subject to think when we look at some of the judgment, the plagues and all of these things, is that a judgment or not? And well, what kind of God do we have and things like this? So we'll be going a little bit further with that. In the New Testament, Jesus is depicted as the one God who comes up as the picture of God and he is the one who heals all disease and uh, uh, infectious uh, skin problems and uh, any type of disease. So wh why do we see Jesus coming suddenly in the New Testament as the, the expression of God, 
the, the likeness of God and the one who help us to understand the heart of God healing every kind of disease. Jesus healed as an exhibition that he had the same power of the God that we have seen in the Old Testament who control all the diseases and everything. Sometimes, uh, one way that we can see, even worldwide pandemics are simply the result of living in a fallen world and not always like something that we want to condemn or something, a specific area. For example, in the tsunami uh, happened in 2004, uh, some people were quick to condemn uh, uh, Sri Lanka and India as being judged by God. But actually, those countries at the time who were the most, the greatest persecutor of Christian were not uh, the Buddhists in uh, Indonesia. Indonesia are not the greatest persecutor of Christians. Uh, it was India and Burma that was the greatest. And they were not affected by that. And uh, those countries that were affected by the tsunami, many Christian perished. Many churches were destroyed. So we cannot just come up with, with some things in a sense to listen to all these prophets of doom and just accept everything that they are saying. Sometimes even worldwide pandemics are simply the result of living in, in, in a fallen world. This is a fallen world with the consequences. Uh, we, have, we have heard about, uh, and we are very sad, this doctor, the, we call him the whistleblower. He was just a, a good guy doing his job in Wuhan, and he has been arrested, forced to, you know, and then he, he lost his life, and then we, the whole world is, 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 is sad, saddened about that. So what happened there is the sinfulness of man that is the cause of many of the, the problems that is happening uh, around us. There is no way to determine whether a pandemic has a spe specific spiritual cause, but we do know that God is sovereign over everything. And Jesus has come to reveal the love of God, and he showed it in healing all diseases. You know, think about uh, uh, the Psalm 91. Uh, that we stay under the wings of the Almighty in the shadow of the, of the Lord and He keeps us from all the sorts of plagues, from the arrows that come during the day or night, the terrors of the night and the plagues. This is, I'm sure, the most prayed prayer actually. It's, it comes from every side to us. But the spread of sicknesses such as Ebola and the coronavirus is, we can say, a foretaste of pandemics that would be part of the end of time. Jesus referred to future plagues associated with the last days. You see it in this text here. There will be great earthquakes and famines and plagues in various places. The two witnesses in Revelation 11 will have power to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. And seven angels will wield seven plagues in a series of final severe judgment described in Revelation 16. So the appearance of pandemic diseases may or may not be tied with God's specific judgment for sin right now. May or may not be. We don't know that, uh, but we can see that there will be uh, something that announce something that will be much more severe in the time, at the, at, w when the end time comes at the time. Since no one knows the time of Jesus' return, we must be careful about saying that global pandemics are proof that we are living in the end times. Do we believe we are? but uh, w when you judge one specific pandemic. For Christian and for non-Christians, those who do not know Jesus Christ, these disease and any disease should be a wake-up call and a reminder that life on earth is fragile, that we are weak, that we are mortal, and that we have a, a, an appointment with death that is a, a ahead of us. As bad as pandemics are, it's really bad, hell for eternity will be worse. Will be worse. So as Christians, we have the assurance of salvation. And we have the hope of eternity because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. There's a great confusion 
that exists about the subject of God's judgment, the end times, the final judgment. So let, let me just talk a little bit about this. Uh, how many times is the word judgment mentioned in the Bible? Um, in the King James, uh, the word judgment comes almost 300 times. Uh, and the word judgments, plural, appears 130 times about. And the word judgment, that is mishpat in the Old Testament, the concept of this word is many of us we think when you hear the word judgment you think of punishment but the word mishpat is not punishment it could be but not necessarily it's much better than that the word uh, mishpat is the process by which a verdict is reached the judge you evaluate the facts you look at what's really happening the cause of something your reason then you come to a verdict and we can see that God is the God of Mishpat. He is the one who can discriminate between truth and lies, between good and evil. God can do that. So it is kind of the, the process by which a verdict is reached or the, the verdict itself. That you're guilty, uh, you have sinned, and a, a consequence will come, and then sometimes a punishment will come as a result. I, I, we understand that. You, you, you look at the, uh, our modern uh, criminal court, you, you, you will see the same thing. There is an investigation, we discriminate about the facts, we come to a conclusion, there is a verdict, guilty or not guilty, and guilty brings a certain type of punishment or uh, a behavior change that is being forced to restore, protect society, keep order, and uh, be just and fair for everybody else that has, would be affected negatively if there would not, not be such a, a standard of, of judgment. So, so don't think of judgment just as punishment. It's more about sorting right and wrong. So that's why we can see that uh, God is so, so, so great. Okay, uh, yes. Um, God is in fact the God of mispath, the God of judgment. Judgment is God's activity. He's been doing that from the beginning of time. And we will look at some scriptures of that before. Nobody taught God about being just and fair, the concept of judgment. Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instructions about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right and show him the path of justice? Deuteronomy 32, he is the rock, his deeds are perfect, everything he does is just and fair, he is a faithful God who does no wrong, how just and upright is he? So if you can look at different Bible versions, they use different uh, uh, way to, to, to phrase up this sentence. For all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness without evil. There's no evil in God. There's no evil in God. And when we think about uh, associating plagues, God, Old Testament, and New Testament, we must rest our faith on the foundations of God is fair and just. There is no evil. God is good. God is perfect. We must establish that. Uh, it is essential for the faith and the survival of, of our faith and the transmission of our faith to our children and to the next generation. For all his ways are just, he is a reliable God who is never unjust, he is fair and upright. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. He is the Lord our God, his judge judgments are in all the earth. He discriminate, he knows he, 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 what's happening. He, he, his verdict of, of how human beings behave is, is perfect. Uh, there's another scripture that someone uh, sent yesterday. I saw it on Facebook and I brought it today. When we want to think about uh, the heart of God in terms of uh, judgments and things like that, look at this wonderful text here from Joel chapter 2. That is why the Lord says, w w is God expressing anger or evil at all in this text here? Turn to me now while there is time. A judgment, a form of punishment, is going to come. God has warned. Another argument, every time in the Old Testament a, a judgment of this nature came, 
it was always after a long time of the patience of God and a long time where God's prophet announced in advance that these judgments were going to come if they were not going to change their evil behavior and be unrighteous in society and evil in their homes and and I immoral and uh, you know and everything god announced it and they were idolatrous and they were they came to a point of killing their children offering it to to false gods they, it was horrible what they have done they took the land uh, of innocent people they still they were violent they were murderers you read all the list of all their crimes in the old testament denounced by the prophets so here you you don't you don't find a tone of of anger of 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 wanting to to punish just for being evil you don't see that at all Turn to me now. This is an invitation to, to peace, an invitation to be loved, an invitation to be restored in the favor and the blessing of God. Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting and mourning. Don't tear your clothing, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God. For now God is describing himself. I think we should listen to God talking about himself. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is slow to get angry. If they, you, you can read, I, I look at this verse with many Bible version. It's very good. And filled with great kindness or loving kindness. The, the, the next part is the place I want you to, to stop and reflect. He is eager to relent and not punish. I want just to stop on that one. He is eager to relent and not to punish. Let me read it in different Bible version. He pities because of the evil. If he, he is sad, he is broken hearted at the sight of evil in society, of, of human being hurting other human being he is sad and also he is broken hearted at the idea of a coming punishment because of the sin of the people he is broken hearted he pities because of the evil he relents from doing harm he relents or he feels sorry over disaster often relenting from disastrous punishment or calamity. And we can understand that. If you are parents, you take care of children, it, I think it's very easy to understand the heart of a loving God, uh, comparing it, even though it's imperfect, to the heart of parents. You have a rebellious teenager, and this teenager commits evil, maybe drugs, a crime, or something like that. You are so sorry. You are so brokenhearted. You, you, you feel sad. But you also want to force the behavior to change, so you will uh, probably enforce a certain uh, rule or uh, try to limit his foolishness uh, uh, creating uh, you will ground him or uh, remove him something you will try to do something to minimize his foolish heart to control him for his good but at the same time that sorts of punishment breaks your heart we I think we understand that easily do we okay so we, we see it from, from God here, described from God. It says, he sighs. The, the terminology here sometimes is uh, translated, he repents. But it's actually, he sighs. He has a, you know, like a strong noise from the nose, like, a, I'm so broken hearted, you know. So that's, that's how I said, he feels sorry, he has pity, and also, he has pity in a favorable sense, like towards something good. He wants something good instead of something evil, so he relents. That is God. That is your God. That is my God. That is described in the Old Testament in such a way. Who knows? Perhaps he will give a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of this curse. 
and that is God. Even when you see a judgment coming, it, it is coming out of, out of love. Sin always has its consequence. And the doctrine of judgments call our attention to both the reality and the nature of the consequences of sin. There's always a, a consequence to sin. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What time is it? Okay. From the beginning of the Bible, I want to go a bit quickly on this, but it is so, so interesting to know because when we're talking about the judgment of God now, from the beginning of the Bible, we see God exercising his judgment according to the definition that I gave to you, the, the mispa, where it's, it's the process of discriminating to come to a verdict or the verdict itself, uh, not only uh, a, a judgment or a penalty. The first one you will see, you have a list here. Let's, let's look at, at this list here. The judgment of Satan and the fallen angel is the first one. Of the, this is a judgment. This is an action that God did from the beginning of time. Was it right or was it wrong? The judgment, the, uh, the Edenic judgment of Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. And after the fall of Adam and Eve as judgment for mankind's disobedience, Adam and Eve died spiritually from their communion with God and began to die physically. And physical death became a, cert a certainty for the future of man. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. There is a judgment to come for the behavior of man because of a sinful nature. The other one is the legal or the global judgment. All human beings are under sin. But the scripture and prison, everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But just the first part, the scriptures imprisoned everything under sin. Romans chapter 5, 12. Therefore, though as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin had not been yet in, imputed when there was no law. So sin was still there, but it was not declared because there was not a standard of the law uh, known to mankind. All of mankind without distinctions are under the curse of sin and judged as sinful and separated from God apart from the saving grace of God in Christ Jesus. All fall short of the glory of God. And the only exception to this rule is the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to life through a virgin birth. He was sinless. He escaped the sin problem, and he became the, the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Judgment of moral degeneration as a consequence of sin that entered into this world. And Romans chapter 1 is a very clear description. When men turn away from the knowledge of God, God's judgment was, uh, Romans 1, 24, therefore God gave them over, that is a form of judgment, he gave them over to the desire of their hearts to impurity, Verse 26, to degrading patient, passions. Verse 21, their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. That is a, a judgment that God gets. You want this? You, you don't want to repent? I give you over to your degrading uh, passions. As they refused to follow the light, their foolish intellectual and reasoning got darker, and they could not discriminate anymore. They lost this ability to discriminate between truth and error. Then you have the judgment of Christ uh, for the sin of the world, which is the, the greatest judgment that God has ever uh, shown or exhibit uh, to show his love to all of us. Christ's judgment for sin. 
He died in place of the sinner that we, we are, bearing our sin and our judgment on the cross and became uh, our substitute. And we find it in Isaiah chapter 53. So God's judgment can be difficult to understand. It's, it's a big subject and we only scratch a small surface. And you may disagree with me and say, oh, you did not cover this aspect or that aspect. I, I'm fine with that. You, you can think uh, as, as you wish. So uh, just uh, some scriptures that I've been referring to over here. And then in closing, God's judgment can be difficult to understand. And that's okay, because we're not qualified to judge God's judgment. Uh, but we can uh, agree uh, with a, a very reasonable argument that God is fair, God is judge, all his deeds are perfect. And then if we can establish it, this as, as a foundation of our faith. God's judgment is always inseparable from his love. Whether you look in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, God's love and judgment go together because he is both s simultaneously. He is just and he is love. We know that and we, we struggle to grasp this because of the limit of our understanding. But we see God's love and God's justice wrapped up together at the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is the, the, the place where we understand how God is love and how God is just at the same time. God's just judgment instruct us about our own character also. Because if you think about the, the revelation of God's verdict and God's standard, it reveals our own character. And I have a, a scripture here that I will refer to. It's from Isaiah chapter 47. And I think it's God speaking to the ba Babylonians. He says, you felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Have you ever thought like that? No one sees me, so it's, it's okay if I sin. I can, not okay if I sin, but no one will know. Okay? Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. But evil shall come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. Disaster shall fall upon you, for which you will not be able to atone and ruin shall come upon you suddenly, of which you know nothing. So God's judgment has this power uh, to reveal our own character because it reveals our own sinfulness. And it, it, it's, it's, it's shocking. You know, when, when someone hides his sin and gets caught, it's, it's not funny, it's, it's not uh, pleasant. But it is most of the time used to create a crisis to lead to repentance, which becomes the positive aspect of that. You, you come to face your sin because you got caught. And then you are forced to either continue or to change and to repent and uh, get back to live in harmony with God. God's judgment reveals our need for a great high priest and a savior. The Old Testament stories of judgment point to our need. They, they tell us that we need, because in the Old Testament you have the priesthood, you have the commandment, you, you have the law, and you have a need, and all of the symbolism of the priesthood and the tabernacle over there, you have to, to point to the need that God should provide a substitute for sinners. Like in the Old Testament it was an animal a lamb, a bull to come for the, for the forgiveness of sin, but uh, eventually leading to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who offered a sacrifice to allow us to understand and to move us into that direction. And the last point, God's judgment it foreshadows, and we, meant, we touched on that point, what will come on the last days. Uh, Matthew 24, 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus will come again to judge mankind. This is clear in the scriptures. And the, the whole idea of what I said today, I want to conclude with that. Scriptures instruct all of us 
who become aware of these truths that we must be ready for that day. That's the only conclusion possible that the most important things that we make, that we are sober-minded, that we are watchful, we look at what is happening around us, all of these global, and it points into that direction, and it points to a, a coming judgment. And we need to, it, it is also a motivation for us to place our faith in our hope in Jesus Christ. He bore our sin. He bore God's judgment so that you and I will never have to be under the judgment of God. That's why Paul says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But, but a judgment was necessary to come to that. For you not to be under the judgment, a judgment was necessary. And it is the love of Jesus Christ that was necessary. I, I, I close with a, with a small story. It's uh, during the time of heavy persecution in uh, Eastern Europe. I uh, don't know the story, don't see the, the, the country, maybe in Albania or something, because it was horrible that time. It was a memorable Easter time, and it is a, a man who was in the congregation who, who tell the story of the pastor on that Easter morning service. It was the morning after a violent attack against our pastor. That Sunday during worship, the pastor Yusuf stood to preach shortly after a strange man entered the sanctuary. That meant trouble. We didn't know how he would respond. With trembling in his voice, he immediately spoke of Christ, the gospel, death, resurrections, and the need for all people to repent and believe. His tone was strong. His eyes were fixed uh, on the congregation. And I sense his look focused past me and aimed directly at our visitors. Yusuf was aware that there was fear in the room, and he decided to only matter about an even greater fear, the coming judgment of God. His spirit filled with boldness was amazing. So there was fear. There was persecutions. So instead of focusing on that fear, he focused on a greater fear the fear of the coming judgment of God. This is much more important. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit with boldness. So for us, this morning as we close, we can trust in God in time like this because we have seen the cross, because you know about the cross of Jesus Christ and the judgment of Jesus Christ so that we will not be judged. We have also a glimpse of what is to come. And we have the assurance of safety in God's presence. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the victorious one, will come, and the Bible describes, will come with the sword and his mouth to wipe out all evil. He's coming. He's coming in power to wipe out all evil. And we are with him. We look to him and we need the cross. Amen? Would you please stand this morning? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's take a few moments this morning to reflect about all of these things and lay our faith to the Prince of Peace, to the Lamb of God, to Jesus Christ on the cross, to his sacrifice for our sin, to the love of God and the justice of God, to the verdict of God, that if you are in Christ here this morning, you have nothing to fear because you have the gift of eternal life. You have the assurance, you have the hope, you have the certainty of God's promises. God loves you. God knows you. God has the power and his own nature to discriminate about good and evil. And he has already pronounced his verdict. In Christ Jesus, 
we are not guilty. We are safe in Christ. Whatever may happen in this world, it's bigger than, than the events that surround us because everything is causing us to look to the future. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to the economy? What's going to happen to our health? What's going to happen to this and that? But just in front of us comes the last days, comes the last judgment, and comes the beginning of eternity as announced in the scriptures. And this is why we come to church to receive comfort, instructions from the scriptures, and peace, and joy, and strength, and that our faith get established on the rock, so that we are not shaken, that when all the kingdoms of this world are shaken, we have received a kingdom that will never shake, that will last for eternity. And Lord, this is such is our faith, Lord, a rock that cannot be moved, Lord. And it is on you that we fix our eyes this morning, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we can ac access to you, that we can pray these promises of God, that we know that our God is a God of love, a God that is just, a God that is fair, a God and who, of whose deeds are perfect. And Lord, we rest on you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen, 